All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're just gonna jump right into the Delta method. We had made a statement about the Delta method. So let's just reformulate that statement and see if we can prove it. Now, again, there's all kinds of levels of proof. I'm gonna go a little bit farther than the book goes. So I think that their proof is a little bit too quick. They do have an exercise in the book to help you work through properties of convergence, but that's some of the stuff we're skipping. So they have like three or four pages in the book to talk about different types of convergence with an example or two. And that stuff is a little hard to wrap your head around sometimes. What type of convergence? What are all these different rules of convergence? There's a statement about Slutsky's theorem. I'm gonna just take it that you know what this stuff is or it's intuitive enough that it's not that surprising. They don't prove it in the book, some of these convergence things. So I'm just gonna take it a step farther than the book. But if you wanna investigate more and you get really into all these properties of convergence, good for you. I think that's great. Um, if you advance towards your PhD, you will be taking an advanced inference class or a measure theory class. And that really is what distinguishes this sort of class where we're using calculus and linear algebra and kind of more rudimentary stuff than all this measure theory. And so you'll get a chance to see more advanced treatments of this. Okay, so the Delta method says this. So if we have a sequence, a sequence of random variables, yn, so that's a random variable, And it has this property such that yn minus some value theta, this is going to be the expectation of yn, times the square root of n. This is going to go to a normal zero sigma squared, where that is going to be the variance of, I'm going to say it like this, the variance of yn is going to be sigma squared over n. So that's that sigma square that shows up right there. Where's the n in this? I pulled it all over to the left hand side so that when we take the limit, all the n's are on the left hand side. And so and there's no n's over here. I'll abuse this in our first treatment of the proof of the delta method. We'll first produce a slightly incorrect proof, and then we'll produce a correct proof so that we can see these nuanced differences. So, this is just saying something that's like the central limit theorem. So an example of this is the central limit theorem. Sum of the xi's divided by n, right here, is x bar n, as i goes from 1 to n, where we have the expectation of the xi's is going to be theta, and the variance of the xi's is equal to sigma squared. So I'm going to call that thing yn. So the arithmetic mean is an example of a sequence that does this. And we prove that. So that's the central limit theorem. One of the coolest things in statistics. I never would have guessed that this is true. So there's a few things that surprise the heck out of me, and it's like it's so beautiful because it's always true, and it might not be exactly intuitive. So it must have been a thrill to figure this out a long time ago. One of the other ones is the fundamental theorem of calculus. So still kind of is like it's a little counterintuitive to me. I don't know if I can explain it without going through the math. So okay, um, central limit theorem. We understand this because we can go through the math. Um, 
The delta method says this. So this is the delta method. That some transformation, so this is a transformation, just a functional evaluation of yn minus g of theta, same transform, times root n is going to go to a normal, with being zero, invariance, sigma squared times g prime theta squared. So that's the derivative of your transform. Um, I should say a little bit more about this. There is an assumption about the derivative of g, and I'm going to leave that out for right now. I'll just say this can't be zero. So, and I think that that's pretty obvious. That if g prime was zero, this isn't a distribution that we understand we understand very well. And so it converges to a point, and that's not true. And so we need to be a little bit more careful. Um, we'll hold off for an example to, to discuss that. So this relies on a Taylor expansion. So the Taylor expansion, so let's just kind of chisel our way through a proof of this. So proof, and this is almost a proof. It's almost correct. What I mean by that is it's wrong, but it would take just a second to fix up. And we might get a little bit of intuition, intuition about this. So we're going to do this first like this, and then we'll fix it up in a line. So here's our Taylor expansion. So Taylor. Taylor says this. This is going to be g theta plus g prime theta yn minus theta, and then plus some remainder term. And so I'll call it Rn. That's what the book calls it. So let's just recall what the remainder looks like. The remainder is just the remaining expansion term. So this is going to be the k derivative evaluated at theta y minus theta, yn minus theta to the k divided by k factorial. k goes from 2 to infinity here. So just to remind you about the central limit theorem, our remainder term looked very similar to this. It was centered differently for our application. We centered it at 0. And we knew what the first three terms of that Taylor expansion was. So this is just a little bit different. Um, the delta method is using this as the approximation. So this is your linear approximation. I just have a quick question. And we'll try to answer this, not this second, unless some of you know. Why not use a better approximation. I.e. Um, a higher order approximation. So if you've read through the book on this, you'll know the answer. So the delta method, and I should call this the first order delta method, but most people just call it the delta method. I would say I've never actually seen anybody use a second order delta method. I see it in a book, I've taught this class now several times, so I see it there every year. But I've never seen it in practice. I've never seen a colloquium. Now, Sam's probably going to come up and say, no, it's used all the time. So, but I haven't seen it. Um, there are possibilities to use higher order expansions, but the first order delta method does not do that. 
And there's a case where you might use a higher order expansion, but you need to be careful. Why don't we use a higher order expansion? Can you this down? Uh, so this is an approximation. The marginal increase in precision from the next order might not be worth the extra work. Maybe it is, though. It's not that much extra work. Take a, you can take a first derivative, you can take a second derivative. So you might be inclined to say, why not just expand until you know it's good? And kind of check that out, and maybe you could do that through a simulation study or something like that. You might be a little bit more analytical. So that's a reason, but it's not the reason. Anybody else? It's worth thinking about. Keep thinking about it for a moment. But don't distract yourself from the proof. We'll come back and we'll answer this question once we understand this a little bit better. It'll kind of jump out at us as we're carving out the proof. So I want to just point out the note, the limit can goes to infinity of y n, this converges to something. What does it converge to? It's closer and closer to a particular value. Probably never attains the value, and in a continuous setting I can say with probability zero it attains the value. But it gets close to it. What does it converge to? This statement is telling you. Theta. So it's converging to theta. So that's good, we know that. Um, so let's just apply a limit. So this is the incorrect part of the proof, to take a limit on the left-hand side. So again, this is incorrect. over g theta right there. There's nothing to do with n. There is an n there, and there's an n in the remaining term. So I'm just going to write this is g theta plus, and I'm going to write limit n goes to infinity g prime theta. There's no n's there. So this is just going to slide right over the top. But I do have y n minus theta and then I take the limit of the remaining, the remainder term. N goes to infinity. Rn. Right here. So, again, I'm going to show you something that's wrong, but at least has an inkling of the right idea in here. And so if I take this limit and I slide it over the top, and I think about what this does in the limit, if I weren't very mathy, I might be inclined to say, oh, this is normally distributed because of this statement right here. And I might treat the n improperly. So I might say this thing is normally distributed, mean zero, variance sigma squared over n. And again, this is going to be times g prime theta right here. So I might be inclined to think that this is normally distributed with mean zero, g prime theta. It's a constant, so I square it. It's a scale factor, because I'm multiplying. So times sigma squared over n. And then we can say something about this, and hopefully we can say it's zero. But if you just say it's zero on a qualifying exam, I'm looking for the reason it's zero. So when I go to score something like that. So I want you to explain it. So this would be a pretty blundered proof right here, but it does have all the right ideas in here. Somebody tell me what's wrong with this. What's wrong with that statement? If I take the limit is n goes to infinity, this is n down here, so that's going to infinity, and this is a zero. So that's an improper treatment of everything. And so we want to get that n over on the other side 
so that we can understand this limit a little bit better. And so this is wrong. So what do we do? We pull the end over on the other side. And it'll fix everything up for us. So let's correct the proof. So this is more correct. And I would call this a correct proof, but of course if the Fields Institute came in, they might say, now you need to work a little bit harder and show every detail and go all the way back to the piano accidents or something like that. That's what mathematicians do. So they try to assume as little as they can and show every step. We won't do that. So what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to subtract g theta off of both sides. I'm going to look at g y. So let's look at g y n. I'll subtract g theta from both sides, right here. I'll write on the right hand side in a second. But I'm going to scale everything. And they don't do this in the book exactly like this. But this is going to be sigma over root n. Right here, this is the way I usually think about it. And so this is the same thing as putting the root n up here. So no difference there. And I just need to do the exact same thing on the, the right hand side. And so I've already subtracted off the g theta. And so now I just have g prime theta y n minus theta over sigma over root n plus my remainder over sigma over root n. So this is starting to look like a correct proof because I have all the ends treated correctly. I should say, when we go to use the delta method in inference, we do something like this. You have finite n, and so you use this approximation and you just throw that into the equation. You'll see this in your upcoming assignments. So let's take a limit now of this. So this is going to be a limit. n goes to infinity. This will look like g y n minus g theta over sigma over root n. So this is very similar to this. I've just taken the sigma and thrown it in the denominator on the left-hand side instead of throwing it right there. And it doesn't matter which one we do. So I could do this. Take that sigma out and write it right there. That's the same thing. And that just makes this a one. So same exact statements. So this is going to be limit n goes to infinity. g prime theta, y n minus theta, plus, and we'll look at these two terms separately, n goes to infinity, r n over sigma over root n. So we will analyze this in just a second, but let's analyze the first term and think about what it does. So we know that the limit here, so if I just take the limit over the top, insert it right here, then I'm going to have, this is g prime theta, and I know what this is, oh, and I missed it, I missed the important part, sigma over root n. So that has to be there because I've divided it on both sides. So this part right here, we know what that converges to. So same exact thing over here, I can replace this by my sigma, I can bring that down, we know what this is. So it's just the same way of writing something that we already know. So this is going to be g prime theta times the limit of this thing. And I know what this does, this is normally distributed with mean zero variance one. Again, I've divided the sigma. 
So I could treat this differently and make it look exactly the way that we wrote it, but I prefer doing it this way. And so this whole thing right here is just a normal distribution with mean zero, multiplying a random variable by a scale factors. Where's the scale factor? So again, I just pulled the sigma down here, so there's that one. So that's normally distributed. So a little bit more treatment, and this is where the book is really fast. They say nothing about it. So I'll say a little bit more about it. There's an exercise in the book, and if you want to work through it, that's fine. I'm not assigning problems like that. So I used to do it in the past. It's, it doesn't work out very well. So. so this part we're good with. Now we just need to say something about the remainder. So our remainder is right here. So let's just look at that. So the remainder terms involve yn minus theta raised to the k power, where k is greater or equal to 2. So here's what's going on here. The numerator right here is converging to zero. The denominator is converging towards zero. And so they're converging both at some rate, and one of three things can happen. So this could either go to zero exactly, or it could blow up to infinity if this starts shooting off to zero much faster than that, or it could converge to something. And so they might be converging to zero at some rate where it kind of stabilizes. And in this case, it's something that bounces around zero. It's normally distributed. But as I power this up, this is going to converge to zero much faster than these linear terms. And so if I speed up the numerator and make that converge to zero faster than the denominator, then the whole thing is going to converge to zero. So this goes to zero faster than yn goes to zero. yn minus theta goes to zero. They both go to zero, but this is going much faster. And now the numerator is outpacing the denominator by a lot. And so if we power this up to anything that was bigger than one, so like 1.0001, that would make it go fast enough that it would outrace the denominator. Now there's a lot of stuff in convergence we could study and we could prove that statement, but I think you can see it. That if all of a sudden these things are, the numerator and the denominator are chasing each other towards zero, they're running towards zero, and then they're kind of stabilizing. They have a similar rate of convergence that bounces things around so that it's normally distributed. If I power up and I speed up, not just by a constant, but by a power, it will make it decay towards zero much faster. And in fact, this is much faster than raising it to 1.0001. Raising it to the second power um, is going to make all of those terms go to zero. So this right here for the second power is going to go towards zero, and all the remaining terms in the remainder have higher powers. So k is 3, k is 4, k is 5, and those are really outracing the denominator. And so that's going to zero. If you say something like this, this goes to zero much faster, it's in the numerator than that, we know that this thing converges, so we know the remainder goes to zero, I will be satisfied with that. Read through the book. Read through. If you want to know what Slutsky's theorem is, it's pretty basic. If I have two random variables that are converging to something, and I take a product of them, they'll both converge to what you think they do, and if you do something in an additive fashion. Two random variables are converging towards something, and I add them together, and they converge to the sum. It's called Slutsky's theorem. 
there's a little application of it. They discuss it in the problem at hand, and you should be at least inclined to go look at that in the book. Again, I won't test you on that. But I do want you to say, if I do ask you to prove the delta method, I do want you to say that these terms are going to zero much faster than those, so every turn in the remainder is decaying towards zero faster than this numerator term. Okay, that's my Calc 101 version of this. Any questions? So not too bad. So almost looked like a right proof the first time, which is mistreated the N, and that's not a profit, proper way to treat limits. So I would say we've proved it. So this thing we now know goes to zero. Okay. Let's back up and look at this approximation again and see if we can answer this question based off of our rationale. I'll leave that on the board. So say we did a higher order approximation. Say we were inclined So say something like this. So the delta method has two things going on in why it's approximate. First, the Taylor expansion, and then second, the asymptotic limit of everything. And so the delta method's not working well. It's either because the, delta, the Taylor expansion, the linear expansion, is not a good approximation to the function, or it could be that the asymptotic limit of everything is converging too slowly for the amount of data that you have. So two things can go wrong. So you might be inclined to say, well, let's just clear that up and try to make it so only one thing goes wrong. And I add more terms in. So if we did that, our Taylor approximation looks like this. G prime, theta, yn minus theta, We'll add in these other terms. A couple of them. Divided by 2, yn minus theta squared. So on and so forth. I'll just write it like this. I'll just call this a different remainder since we've used that notation already on the board. So my remainder has one less term in it. You could do this and do the cubic term as well. So let me just go back to that original proof that wasn't quite correct. What is this thing converging to? Incorrectly. Normal zero sigma squared over n. It's something like that. What is this? Converging to. Is this normally distributed? No. So that's not normally distributed. How is this distributed? This has some chi squared distribution. So this is chi squared distributed. Approximately. So I'm not going to take a limit just so I can write all this out, and I won't butcher my argument by taking a limit. This is something like a chi-squared distribution. And this is something like a normal distribution. So this is normal zero sigma squared over n approximately. In the limit, it's exact. We never actually see that in practice. You only get close. If I add together these two random variables, what random variable is that? What's a chi-squared plus a normal? I'll give you $100 if you can name that distribution. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't know what it is either. So I've never seen it used. I guess we could probably figure it out, but it's not anything clean. And it's not anything that's going to make your life easier. 
So keep in mind, when are people doing the delta method? I tend to think people use the delta method in groups, and if you use it in applications, I tend to think you're probably a little on the old side. So there's probably better things to do out there. Saying that, delta method can work okay. And so I want you to experience this. So that's what our upcoming assignment will be about. It's not just a proof of the statement in treating things with limits, but in statistics, we actually apply this stuff and we use it and we want to know how well it works. So we'll study that problem later on. And you can make your decisions about this. If I add it in a third order term, what's that distribution? So something like a normal cubed. I don't know. So it's a distribution we don't know about, and adding all those together isn't going to help you very much. Let's look at an example of where the delta method goes terribly wrong. They present, but I always like to see an example where everything goes horribly wrong. Well. So let's say these right here are normally distributed. So I'll say mean mu variance sigma squared. So everything's IID. I want to point out that the statement of the delta method doesn't require IID. It just requires that whatever y n is, is converging to normality. So there are not independent sequences that do that as well. So this example is an IID example. So the delta method formally doesn't require everything to be IID. Um, let's just say we're interested, say we're interested in some transform. G mu is equal to mu squared. Okay, so we know that x bar n, again, this is just the arithmetic mean, 1 to n, this is normally distributed. Same mean, rescale variance. This is not an approximation. So this is exact. And that's because these things are normal. And you can prove that. So sums of normals are normal. Rescaling normals is still normal. This is exactly normal. It's not an asymptotic result. So now we're all going to be just thinking about how good is this Taylor approximation? So delta method says something like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say g of x bar n, that's what we apply this to. This maybe looks something like a normal distribution with mean g mu. We know what that is, it's mu squared. g prime mu squared times sigma squared over n. So delta says, this is true, 
This is an approximation. So I'm kind of switching my mindset to being a statistician and I'm just using the approximation. Let's assume n is maybe big enough and maybe this result holds. And so that's how statisticians would use a result like this. So again, this is just a probability statement and in the next example I'll show you how to apply this in practice. So this thing right here is just normally distributed mu squared, this is going to be the derivative of mu squared is 2 mu squared sigma squared over n. So this is normally distributed mu, mu squared 4 mu squared sigma squared divided by n. Okay, so nothing on my sleeve, that's just all true. So delta method does say this. So, but how well the delta method applies depends on what mu is. So if mu is going to zero, then this thing is going to zero, and this thing is going to zero. And so when this thing is gonna go to a normal zero, zero. And that doesn't make any sense. So that would be a terrible approximation. So if I apply the delta method to this, and I said, well, if you give me this thing right here, what did I just say my approximation of this is? How do I think it's distributed? I think it's distributed centered at zero with variance zero. So I think that thing is zero. And that's not the case. So again, if mu is zero, this thing is still fluttering around. It's not exactly zero. And the delta method approximation is saying just approximate it to zero. And so there's this caveat. And we didn't say it. I guess we said it, we didn't write it down. But we need our derivative to be non-zero. And that's where, what went wrong here. For the delta method to apply, we need G prime. In general, I'll go back to my statement about theta just to use our old notation. This thing cannot be zero. And in our case, g prime mu cannot be zero for us to use this. If it is zero, the first order delta method doesn't work. And that's where the second order delta method was concocted to deal with this. So the second order delta method uses, no surprise, the second order expansion. So GYN is going to be approximately G theta plus zero. I'll put that term in there. That's the first order term. So I should say if down here, g prime theta is equal to zero. That's where that zero comes from. g double prime theta divided by two, y n minus theta, right here. Squared. And then I have that remainder term. So the delta method, you, the second order delta method uses this, and they recognize this is a chi-squared distribution. And so this is just, I should make an actual formal statement of the second order method. 
And from my perspective, I don't use the Delta method. If it were 1960s, I probably would, because it would be the best thing going. Um, I guess I'll say that. So um, the second order method says this thing, GYN minus G theta is going to be the limit of this thing is going to be a G double prime theta divided by two sigma squared. I still need to deal with the sigma squared. I could divide it out right here. And this is times a chi-squared distribution. And if you want, it's that. So this is a scale chi-squared. So there's all this. Where does the two come from? It's just that term. Right there. And they write this down in the book, and then they proceed. Uh, I would say, keep this in mind. It's definitely interesting. It's fun to think about. But we can ask this question all day long. What if G double prime was zero? So your host there as well. And I could come up with an example that did that. I could have taken this example and turned my transformation into mu cubed instead of mu squared. And I would still have problems. What would you do? You would have to understand what the distribution of a cube normal looks like. And that's not something back in the 1960s that they cabled for you. So you'd be out of game. And so you wouldn't know what to do. Um, I'm going to move on unless there's any questions. Any questions about this? Okay. So what I am thinking about when I see all this, and I felt this way all through college and graduate school, that's cool that the limit does this. But in reality, and it's finite, how good is it? And if you're a mathematician, you're going to talk about the asymptotics, and you're say, well, you know, that in this extreme case, here's what happens. And I would ask the same question over and over and over again. And that person might tell me about the convergence rate. So let me just ask, how quickly does this converge to this asymptotically? Can you see it? Have you guys learned this before? So it converges at this rate, root n. So if you think about that function and you graphed it, how quickly that's climbing right there, that's how quickly, in an asymptotic sense, this thing is converging. So it converges in order n to the one half. And people will consider that, it's kind of quick. It's not super quick. It's relatively slow. So, you know, converging linearly would be faster. Quadratically would be faster. That would be better. So it's converging at some rate. In all of these problems, regardless of what g is, and regardless of what yn is, and what theta is in all of this, I still say the same thing. It converges at the asymptotic rate of n to the half. That's how the variance is decaying. So it converges at that rate. Uh, however, for different problems, they will behave differently with different g's in different thetas and different y-n sequences. And so what we're arguing about is the constant, the multiplicative constant that sits out in front of the rate. And that multiplicative constant absolutely matters in practice. And so I like thinking about asymptotics. If you tell me things converge like hyper fast or something like that and you write something down, I might get thrilled and be excited about that. But at the same time, I'm still going to need to check it for different g's and different thetas and different sequences. How fast does it actually happen? So what I mean is something like, is n equal to 31 good enough? And for a lot of problems, it is not good enough. And in the problem that you'll be studying on the homework, it will be good enough in some cases and not good in other cases. This is the problem we're going to study. So in our upcoming 
simulation study. We'll look at Xi's are going to come from a Bernoulli distribution. Prior P, everything is IID. We're going to study this. And then we're going to try to estimate some function. We'll try to learn. this transform. And although if you tell me P, I can tell you P over 1 minus P, if you're trying to learn this with data, this is actually a hard problem than just learning P, even though it's a transform. I don't mean the point estimates are hard to learn, but the uncertainties change quite dramatically. And so the rate of convergence here is going to be different than P converging. And so if I asked you to try to estimate P, pretty much everything will work well. What happens horribly wrong right here is when P is big, or even if P is small, they both have problems. But you can see it instantly that if P is close to the boundary, close to one, this is gonna be a big problem. And how often might that be true? Well, if P, true P was close to one, and N was small, you would see that. And so, the linear approximation of this, it's not horrible, but it's not great. But the asymptotics as I get closer to that boundary are going to be completely perturbed. So when P is about in the middle, about 0.5, there's so much variability around there that you end up seeing ones and zeros. So if, however, P is close to the boundary, you might get a sequence of all ones or all zeros, and that's a bit of a problem. And so chances are P isn't actually zero or one. If it were, you wouldn't be studying the problem. And so I will contest that all problems that have P around 0.5 have been well studied already. I don't know if that's true. So somebody can come in and correct me about the whole number of problems where something's kind of obvious. But what we're really interested in is a lot of problems where P is either really small or really big. And so if you want to think about the really big case is the complement of that, then you're looking at something really small. So perhaps something like genes, you know, that are floating around the population, maybe genes that give you certain diseases or make you susceptible to certain diseases. So we try to study those all the time, and hopefully diseases aren't just rampant. Usually it's a small percentage of people that get particular types of cancer or something like that your genome makes you susceptible to that. And so studying rare events is probably where the money's at these days. Okay, so we'll come back next time. We'll apply the delta method to this, so it's not hard to do. I'll show you how to use the delta method in inference. So again, we're going to come up with some result that looks something like this. This is going to be G of X bar and over 1 minus x bar. I'm leaving a little bit out. x bar is a good estimator of p. So taking that transformation right here is going to look like this. So gp, g prime p squared, and then this is going to be my variance of everything. So this is going to be 1 minus p times p divided by n. And that's the variance of uh, the sum of the x i's divided by n. And so that's what the delta method says. What you're actually going to do with this is what we want to learn is we want to learn this thing right here. So gp, so we're going to flip all of this around. We don't know what p is, but we do know an approximator of p, and that's x bar. So the way people utilize the delta method, not as a mathematical result, but as an inferential tool, is they'll take this thing right here and they'll plug x bars in everywhere you see the p's. And so how good of an approximation is that? I.e., how often do the intervals that you would get out of that approximation cover the truth? You'll study that. So if you want to get started on that, you can.
but I'd say hold off for at least another day. You'll also be applying this in the bootstrap case, so that's not hard to do. So you'll just reshuffle everything. You'll come up with bootstrap estimates of this right here. After we go through this, it'll take about 10 minutes. Then I'm going to move on to Bayesian methods. So if you want to get an advanced look at that, that shows up in chapter seven. I just want to get ahead of the game so that we have a lot to talk about when we get to chapter six. We can actually start comparing stuff. So if you want to review on Bayesian methods, we'll be studying this problem as well. That's it for now, you guys. I'll see you on Friday.